Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Sunday Seconds with the Duke on the MHM Podcast Network, our monthly white hat reviews of films dedicated to the stuff men are made of, John Wayne. I'm Chris. No, I'm I'm Chris. I've been Chris for the last like, <laughs> months. Uh, we de uh, you a couple episodes ago. Oh, I've been uh, de Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess I'm back to being just a lowly little Patrick. Uh, and I'm Shane, and two Chris's and a Shane. <laughs> and for this month's episode, we are reviewing 1970s Rio Lobo. Directed by Howard Hawks and starring John Wayne, Jorge Rivero, Jennifer O'Neill, and Jack Elam. Um, but before we start talking about uh, this film, let me do a quick summary here. Colonel Cord McNally loses his friend, Lieutenant Ned Forthsight. When Confederate thieves raid a Union Army payroll train for its gold during the Civil War, McNally and his men take chase, but the pursuit thins them out until McNally is all alone. Confederates capture McNally, but he eventually overpowers the leaders, Cordona and Phillips, and the Union captures them instead. McNally tries to learn who the identity of the traitors are who sold out the Union. However, they won't rat the men out and are thrown into a northern prison. Time passes and the war ends. McNally visits the two upon their release from jail and asks them about the traitors again. The three have newfound respect for each other, but the two Confederates cannot provide any names to McNally, only physical descriptions which are rather vague. McNally tells them that he will be in Blackthorn, Texas, if they ever have any new information. Phillips plans to return to his hometown of Rio Lobo, Texas, which is nearby and the three men go their separate ways. McNally arrives in Blackthorn and meets Shasta Delaney from Rio Lobo. She demands Blackthorn Sheriff Pat Cronin arrest a deputy from Rio Lobo for murder, but he just doesn't have the jurisdiction. Later at the town's bar, McNally and Cronin chat while Shasta sits a few tables over. A posse from Rio Lobo arrives to arrest Shasta, but she shoots the leader quicker than Harrison Ford can shoot Greedo dead (laughs) a shootout ensues and mcnally and cronin take out the rest of the posse cordona pops up from above and shoots the last man cordona ids whitey as one of the men who sold out the union on the train robbery cordona is in town because phillips needs help when a man named ketchum starts cheating local ranchers out of their land in rio lobo Ketchum also has Rio Lobo's sheriff killed and has installed his own lackey, Blue Tom Hendricks, as the new sheriff. McNally, Cordona, and Shasta head out to Rio Lobo to find the townsfolk living in terror. Hendricks arrests Phillips for stealing his own horses and keeps him as a bargaining chip against his father who won't hand over his land. McNally learns Ketchum is Union Sergeant Major Ike Gorman, the second trader he's looking for. He tracks Ketchum down with the help of Phillips' father and forces him to sign back the ranch deeds to their rightful owners. They head back to Rio Lobo and order Sheriff Hendricks and his men out of the jail or they will kill Ketchum. Meanwhile, Cordona races off to find the U.S. Cavalry so they can take possession of Ketchum. Unfortunately, Hendricks' men capture Cordona on the way. They bring him back to the jail to trade him for Ketchum. A gunfight ensues that leaves McNally wounded And Ketchum, Sheriff Hendricks, and most of his men dead. With the town liberated, life returns to normal for a happy ending. Uh, Now, Patrick, this uh, sounds eerily similar to two other John Wayne films we reviewed. Did it do as well as Rio Bravo or El Dorado? No, Rio Lobo released on December 18th, 1970, a Christmas present to the world. Uh, made on a budget of six million dollars, grossed uh, nine point two, almost nine point three million dollars worldwide. 
uh, adjusted for inflation, that's about $74.5 million by today's standards. So it's not a very high grossing film. Uh, it was the 66th highest grossing film of Wayne's career. Uh, highest grossing films in 1970. Uh, number five was Woodstock. Number four, Patton. Three, MASH. Two, Airport. And does anyone have any idea what the number one grossing film of 1970 was? Uh, I would have said MASH, but you've already said that. Maybe Beneath the Planet of the Apes? Oh, a very obscure pick. Not even close. Chris? No, I have no clue. Well, I'm very surprised that the romantic Shane could not figure out that Love Story was the number <laughs> 1970. Never seen it. Um, that's Ali McGraw and Ryan O'Neill, isn't it? I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I have seen it. And I go, that was the number one movie of 1970? Really? Okay. I saw the Warren, Warren Beatty remade it. I saw that one. Okay. Rotten Tomatoes, Shane's favorite uh, statistic, has this at 71% critics and 73% audience. So there, there you go. That That's the very limited statistics on Rio Lobo. And uh, one interesting statistic that you didn't mention, uh, that uh, director Howard Hawks, this was the last film he directed or produced in his career. And yeah, but only because he died. But that's well, No, like seven years later, I think he passed away, like 77. So he had a few good years left. But um, Howard Hawks is a, a favorite on the program. Some of my favorite films he directed, uh, 1932 Scarface, uh, The Big Sleep, which is an awesome film. Uh, Red yeah. River I like, Rio Bravo I think we all agreed was great. Um, I don't know how anybody feels about Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. That's not one of my favorites. But Howard Hawks I think is a really great director. Patrick, what did you think of this for his swan song? When you said you wanted, and this is one Chris has wanted to review for well, since the beginning, and I remember watching this when I was a, a film major in college for a while, and we reviewed, you know, we did a series of Howard Hawks films. We did Scarface, we did Real Bravo, we did Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and then we did this. And it's like that thing on Sesame Street, one of these things is doing his own thing. It just did not, I mean, those three are outstanding films, and then there was this film. And I don't know why we reviewed it other than I was you know, taking a class at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and this was filmed at Old Tucson. Uh, so that I always took as a sneaking suspicion of why we reviewed it. But, you know, Rio Bravo was also filmed at Old Tucson as well. So uh, that's an actual good film. A lot of good films were filmed there. It, you know, it's it just pales in comparison. Why Howard Hawks kept coming back to this kind of theme or similarities between the film. It's not a a shot for shot remake or even a close uh, remake of Rio Bravo, but there's a lot, there's a tremendous amount of similarities in it. And it just, it, it doesn't play as well as Rio Bravo or even El Dorado, which is also a, a you know, kind of amalgam of Rio Bravo in a kind of a different circumstance. So it's, you know, it was better watching it this time was better than I remembered. It was, I thought visually it looked pretty good. I just, the acting in it was horrible, and I thought the story was predictable. <laughs> yeah, especially after seeing the other two. Uh, Shane, what did you think of uh, Howard Hawks' final film? Uh, well, I didn't realize it was his final film, so thank you for that stat. And one he made, one of my favorites, you didn't mention, was His Girl Friday. He did that film. Oh, yeah. I, I sort of love love that film, and, and uh, period periodically I like a lot of his films, but certainly not all of them. But I've got to say, and <laughs> you probably laugh, but this is the best John Wayne film I have reviewed oh, since Jesus. joining the podcast. Oh, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Howard Hawks' his cinematography wasn't great, but it was not bad. And I want to talk about the music later and stuff, but just on the film itself, uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. It was a really good film, totally entertained by it. And Jennifer O'Neill, I know we'll talk about the actors shortly too, but she was on fire. She was really good, and I like the acting in it overall. <laughs> I, I'm shocked when you guys just said you didn't like it. Or, or I was watching this just a matter of you know 24 hours mm -hmm. ago for the podcast for the first time, never seen it before, mm -hmm. as as I haven't many John Wayne movies, and was in just engulfed by it 
Well, I went not right from the beginning because that mandolin musical intro in the credits didn't do it for me. But the film itself, from the uh, that train action scene at the start to the end, was great. Now, um, John Wayne doesn't have too many more films under his belt after this as well because he will die shortly. Uh, was he seventy eight? Why am I blanking out right now? Seventy nine. Uh, when he made this? No, when he passed away. I think he was 79 when he passed away. Okay. So he's he's in his 70s at this point because what was it, 77, 78 is when he dies? Yeah, yeah. And- well, this this was filmed, like this was released in 1970, so they would have filmed it in 69. So he was about, what, nine or ten years off from passing away? Yeah, about yeah. that. And, I mean, you could tell in this one, he, it, he was, it was tough watching him get up and down on that horse. Uh, he, you know... It, he looked out of shape at this point. Um, I mean, he just wasn't the presence that we're used to in all these films, but uh, Shane, what did you think of John Wayne's performance in this? Cause he, he wasn't even, he didn't really have a love interest in this, like other films either. He was just kind of there cruising through life. He was. And I was surprised because for a little while there, I was a bit worried he was going to be the, um, you know, the love interest for Jennifer O'Neill's character, Shasta Delaney, I think was her name. The worst Shasta. name ever. Yeah, it was a bit weird, but you're right. And even at the start where he gets knocked over the head and falls into the water, I thought he didn't fight back. You know, he got jumped and he did, and this is unusual because John Wayne usually bites, you know, that, any excuse. But as for his acting, I mean, it was a little lighthearted. There was snappy dialogue in it. So I think, obviously, Howard Hawks wanted that that lighter tone, even though there was a bit of violence in it towards the big finale and the shootout, and that was a little bit strong. I was, wasn't expecting some of that. But uh, his acting wasn't too bad. I, I thought he had some really good one-liners in it, and it was believable enough. Although I did spot a body double when... He was on the stagecoach. You, know, you could just see the long shot wasn't actually John Wayne. When when I saw him this one, he didn't have his same intensity. He kind of had a smirk, I thought, throughout the film, whether it was the bad guy he was talking to or the the two Union soldiers, which he later befriended. But it seemed like he was just bemused the whole time instead of actually uh, concerned that he could get hurt. You mean hurt in real life? Uh, like I, riding a horse or just hurt in the film and might get shot. That's, hurt like he might get shot. I, I mean, even when he got shot at the end of the film, uh, I mean, he pulled off the limping, but I, he, his facial expression, he, but it, you, it wasn't believable that he was injured. I mean, there, there was no, he didn't really emote a whole lot other than uh, he kind of seemed happy. Uh, it, we're still talking about John Wayne. I mean, he, he didn't do a lot of emoting in most of his films. This is traditional John Wayne. I, I don't. I I'm not going to say it's a horrible performance. It's not his best by any stretch of the imagination. But it it's in his wheelhouse. I I think of the acting performances of all the leads, his is the best. Which isn't saying much because I don't think most of the other performances are any good. Mm-hmm. But with the exception of Jack Elam, but that's just char- that's that's the character he always plays in films. It's just kind of that crazy old man type of role. Um, but it was, you know, I I thought it was okay. I, I wasn't bothered by his performance in the film. I was bothered by everyone else's. Well, let's talk about some of the co-stars. the The next big name, I guess you could say, or the next main actor, Jorge Rivero. I think um, you could just next name. That's yeah, yeah the, just the next name. I don't know if he did any movies or if he was just a big Mexican television star, but he did not even speak English, so he was doing his lines phonetically, from what I understand. And he did have a kind of unusual accent. When I heard him talk, I didn't really believe that he was doing a French accent. I mean, it, it, he definitely had a foreign sounding accent, but between the strange accent and the not being able to pronounce English words properly, that threw me off for most of his performance. Uh, Shane, you said you didn't mind the acting. Uh, did that? Did you notice anything about that? Or Well, I, I didn't mind the acting from... Most of the co-stars, but as for Jorge, uh, I didn't realize he was phonetically phoning it in. 
basically. Uh, yeah, and he wasn't he wasn't great at all. But he does say in the movie at some point he's of mixed race. He says he was part part Mexican, part something else, French maybe. French, I'm not yeah. sure, but that's probably why he's got that really out there accent. Yeah, horrible. It explains a lot. I didn't know that watching it years ago, and I didn't know that until after um, watching it this time and doing the research that they said that. But, yeah, I I thought he was just generally horrible through, through most of the film. Uh, you know, I'm not shocked that he was speaking phonetically and didn't understand the words he w- that were coming out of his mouth. Yeah, that would have helped just at least knowing what he was saying. Uh, to give maybe some expression to it. But I, I think out of all of the characters in the film, he, his performance was the most off-putting. I disagree with that. <laughs> you disagree. Well, oh, how about oh. Jennifer or O'Neill? Patrick, uh, what did you think of her performance? I thought she was utterly horrible. I, I thought that, she, and I know Shane's already said that he liked her performance, but I, I yes. Like, she it was grating to me the whole time that everything was overacting. Um, she seemed out of place through the entire thing. I, I during the research finding that she uh, generally pissed off Howard Hawks with kind of prima donna prima donna like behavior on the set that he ultimately cut her out of the ending of the film and gave her lines to uh, Sherry Lansing. Uh, due, due to the fact that he just didn't want to have her in the film and th- that, and I think you can kind of see that evolution as she's involved in the storyline until they get to the town. And then she becomes essentially a, a throwaway character. She's not even involved in the ultimate uh, shootout at the end of the film that she's just kind of along for the ride. And uh, I, completely forgettable character, a horrible acting performance. And I I think the low of the film. Well, can I disagree? Because I was surprised that you've just jumped to the end of the movie. And I was surprised that she wasn't there. And it was Sherry Lansing with that whole sequence towards the end. So obviously now I know why, because that sort of seemed weird to me, but I liked her. I don't think she was overacting. She was sort of a little bit loose, at times, but one, she looked gorgeous. I've got to say, I was really attracted to her. And two, she sort of showed, showed traits where she took it upon herself to do things. And I don't think that was very common in, in Westerns for a female to do that. Maybe, maybe, maybe I haven't seen them, but she took it upon herself to shoot the deputy who was following, following her into the bar. And um, when the... Captain Pierre was trying to put the blanket around her and he held, you know, he held her. She said, no, I'm not that kind of person and pulled back. You know, I don't know if that often happens in these kind of Westerns. So it surprised me. And I, I was taken by her. I don't think she was a fantastic actress by any means, but for the role she played and for the type of movie it was, I liked her performance a lot. Yeah, I'm not a big fan, but I, I just think it's very odd the way she was cut out. Basically, I think she wasn't in it for the last 15, maybe 20 minutes when they dropped her off at uh, the one rancher's house and said he told him he'd make sure she got back to town okay. you know. Um, and then she might have been there for like two seconds at the end where um, Cordova walked over to a girl, presumably her. I don't know if it was a double or if it was her. And uh, you know, you don't even get it was a double. You don't get a resolution with the fact that he was trying to propose to her or anything. So, um, you know, they they did that very poorly. So I don't know how much was her fault, but I'll, I'll agree with Patrick. She was there was times she was very hard to watch. Now we we don't normally talk about a fourth person, but um, I thought we'd jo- talk about Jack Elam. Uh, I know him basically from from cannonball run Two, which I used to watch on the HBO loop all the time. So that's kind of distracting for me, him. And, um, I forget the actor's name who played blue Tom Hedricks, but he was in uh Smokey and the bandit. No way you can come from my loins. Um, so, you know, those <laughs> two characters, those two actors, they're, they're, they're kind of typecast for me in my mind. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard to imagine them in any other movie. I mean, Jack Elam's character wasn't terribly serious, but Hendrix was a pretty serious character, and I just couldn't buy it because of 
Smokey and the Bandit. Uh, what did you think of either their performances? Well, Jack Elam is, you know, he's a, I know him primarily as a comedic actor, primarily because of Cannonball Run. That's the film that I remember him distinctly as a kid. But I remember seeing him in other films, and I, although I cannot recall a single one right now, but it was, he was kind of the comedy relief. And that's kind of the role he plays in this film. Although I did find it interesting that they kind of write him off as like, oh, he's the old man. And yet he's like seven or eight years younger than John Wayne when he made this film. So it, he wasn't really, I mean, John Wayne was the old man. Um, Jack Elam was just the odd looking guy who, you know, you know, could grow a beard and look a little half crazy. Uh, I, <laughs> I generally liked him in the film. I thought he added something to it. He's, uh, I, I'm not bothered by a performance. The other guy, and and uh, who from Smokey and the Bandit Junior, uh, you know, I, I like you, Chris. He will forever be Junior in my mind, and and I always forget he's in this film and he's playing it serious. And it's it's unfortunate that I it, that this film came along after I saw Smokey and the Bandits one, two, and three. Uh, and, and therefore I'm always going to remember him as this dim-witted junior guy. Cause I don't take him serious. He's not a serious viable threat to me in this film throughout, you know, and not supposed to be, I guess really, but yeah, he, he doesn't seem sinister to me in any way, shape or form. I just keep waiting for him to say, gosh, daddy, I lost my hat, you know, and, and just saying stupid shit like that. And that's, that, that's what I know that actor for, but he, you know, he, that's not his fault. When they cast him this, it was, you know, seven years before Smokey and the Bandit. So it's just the order of which I saw them. That That's why I remember him as that. Uh, well, Jack Elam, I'm surprised you guys haven't mentioned a movie that you've done on a podcast previously. Um, one of my favorites, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Jack Elam's in that. And he did. He's, in, <laughs> he's in Gunfight at the OK Corral. So, Two pretty solid westerns, um, but very different in this. And you're right, crazy eyes. He's got a few loose screws going on, massive grey eyebrows matching his beard. He wasn't threatening. He wasn't funny. He was just m more annoying than anything else. He's also in Once Upon a Time in the West. I always forget about that one, too. Mm -hmm. That's a great film. Oh, yeah, film. the Charles Bronson movie. You're right. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that you specifically liked about this film? I mean, the beginning was different than the other two. Uh, there was no real uh, Confederate war or uh, Civil War theme going on in the other two. What did you think of uh, – did you like anything in this one? You know, uh, I, having not seen it for probably about 20 years or so, uh, I had forgotten how long the Civil War portion of it. So that was kind of a little entertaining on my part. I, I remember there was a Civil War. I didn't. I thought it would lasted like five, ten minutes, but it went on a lot, lo a lot longer than that. Um, I liked the idea, the camaraderie between uh, the uh, Rivero character and the John Wayne character that, you know, even though the war is over, that there's a mutual respect and that, you know, he buys a bank and he wants to f find out information. That I, I like that aspect of it. Um, I thought that I didn't think the cinematography was that bad, but I'm always a little bit uh, sentimental to things shot around old Tucson. And before Shane uh, brings it up, I like the score. I think the score was outstanding in this uh, film that uh, other than I agree with Shane, the beginning opening credits portion was a little bit out of place, but I thought the rest of the score was pretty good. And actually was the score was released uh, worldwide uh, as a you know soundtrack LP. So it it was at least popular enough in the time, even though it didn't come from a popular film. But th those were things I did like about the, the film. Um, things that I liked uh, were definitely, and I didn't realize it was her until afterwards, the beautiful woman washing her hair was Sherry Lansing. I don't know about you guys, but I thought she was gorgeous. Uh, I also really liked the opening, the train sequence, extended train sequence at the start and throwing the hornets inside the train and then stopping it with the ropes and, and all that. I, I thought it was quite quite well done. And just overall, I really was entertained by it. it now we're discussing it. It had plenty of flaws, but I obviously liked, liked it more than you guys. And as for the music, I'm not surprised it was released on an LP uh, Jerry Goldsmith, I mean, he's fantastic, you know, undoubtedly. Um, this isn't one of his greatest scores, but it's up-tempo. 
mostly um, upbeat, uh, entertaining, and except for that mandolin musical intro, intro, as we said, which was very much out of place, and I'm glad it was at the start, not the end. It was, it was a very good soundtrack. Um, I enjoyed it. But, you know, a guy who's done Gremlins and Poltergeist and even Congo, he's been around and done a lot of different kinds of movies. It suited the Western style, his tunes in this one. Yeah, I liked how the beginning started as well. I thought that train robbery was was pretty great. They, they pulled it off very well. It, that type of beginning, it also, this is kind of silly, but when I was a kid, I used to watch a lot of Disney shows and stuff like the Apple Dumpling Gang and stuff. And they and I kind of got that vibe from uh, watching the beginning of this film, kind of just the look, the color of the cinematography and um, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia in that. And, and plus, I think Howard Hawks did an excellent job at the beginning of this film. I do think uh, because it, once that we get out of the Civil War and he's already done a very similar storyline three times. Um, and one as recently as 1967 for El Dorado. So just a couple of years before, uh, you know, it's not the rest of the story, I, I think, is a little played out for me at that time. But I think the beginning of this started very well. Now, uh, John Wayne films have been known to have controversies, and for this one, to me, the controversy is the casting. I know we kind of broached it briefly, but, man, I just think that they really missed the mark on a lot of castings in this film. They tried to get Robert Mitchum back. I know John Wayne was joking that he wanted to play the drunk in this version. Um, I think Jennifer O'Neill's a little miscast, considering she didn't get along with Howard Hawks and she was misappropriated. Um, Jack Elam, uh, John Wayne even resented him upstaging him from time to time. But what did you think of the overall casting in this one, Shane? Uh, I, I liked it. I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think it was some of high Oscar nominated caliber, obviously. But yeah, uh, there was a Mitchum in it, Christopher Mitchum. Which who was also the, miscast, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I didn't recognize the guy from Smoking the Bandit, so I'm a bit behind on that one. Um, I thought it was okay. I, I, th I don't think the focus stayed on along with the co stars long enough to m ruin them as an act, you know, as from an acting point of view. Even catch him. I mean, Victor French is, is quite a uh. He's done a lot of different roles throughout when he was acting in his career, but he didn't do much in this. So it was uneventful when it came to some of them, but then I liked them as a whole, as a collective. So it was okay. I, You know, I pretty much covered it already. I think Wayne is the strongest performance. Actually, I take that back. I think Jack Elam is probably the strongest performance because he plays the role he's supposed to play. Uh, after that, you know, Wayne, John Wayne plays John Wayne. That's this is this is you know traditional John Wayne Western material, and he's more of Grandpa John Wayne. And this is kind of what I remember him as as when I was younger, when I saw some of the movies in his, late in his career. Outside of that, I mean, even Sherry Lansing, although I think absolutely beautifully gorgeous, um, playing playing uh, a Mexican character, yeah, can't really pull that off. It, it's <laughs> not not really believable and and with both her and jennifer o'neill i think they were cast both strikingly beautiful women i mean unbelievably so uh and but didn't really have the action acting chops to pull off the what they were supposed to do in this film and they i find them more of a distraction that aren't even really necessary i mean you could have combined those characters into one character and you know and it's kind of limited the scope because it was funny because i had not having watched this for a long time i remember the uh topless scene with sherry lansing because that sticks out in my juvenile little mind but i always thought that was the main the lead female and then i was like when jennifer o'neill showed up in the other town i was like well, when does she get like like she have her top off with the other guy and and then that obviously it's a completely different character because that's how much those characters just blur together for me in my memory of this film. But uh, it, it, I mean, not not the best. No, by no stretch of the imagination, the best uh, acting performance or ensemble piece of a John Wayne film. 
Well, those two women, their their parts basically got merged at a certain uh, point. Just be yeah, literally did at the end because yeah. Jeff O'Neill pissed off Hawks. But it's mm. you know, but for that, did did my buzzer did my time run out? I'm sorry, I didn't answer in time. But <laughs> no, <laughs> so Wrong but answer. yeah, but it, it, it just obviously it's that if your characters can be just so easily be changed like that, then maybe they're not completely necessary for the story of the film. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this film did have too many characters. Um, I think they could have paired it back. Uh, that topless scene, though, wasn't really a topless scene. It was a side boob scene. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, there was no actual nudity, but... It's it's pretty risque for a John Wayne film. John Wayne was very much against nudity in films, and although you don't see anything, it, it's very implied in this in, in the film. So that you, you don't and, and for a Howard Hawks film as well. I mean, wish we would have seen, had a scene like that of Marilyn Monroe in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, but it didn't happen. <laughs> I'm sure she would have done it too. So. Well, I, you know, I mean, if he was against nudity, I spotted two naked gentleman soldiers showering in the Emporium, which doubled as a pub, and was showering while everyone else was drinking around them. Um, Shane, I go to the side boob, you go to the men showering. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I only hey. brought it up because you said there was no, he doesn't like nudity, but there was two men there mm. happily showering while everyone else was having a drink in the pub. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. He only noticed for critical reasons. Okay. <laughs> Something else I noticed, and I don't know whether it was because it was on high def or not, but the Spurs, every time they'd walk around, not just John Wayne, but some of the other Cowboys, the Spurs were like really jingling loud through my TV. So, yeah, I don't know if they were enhanced because of the what I was watching it in, but I hadn't noticed that in too many Westerns previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just the natural sound of spurs on a wood sidewalk. Yeah. And we mentioned Sherry Lansing, of course, a couple of times now, including Patrick's favorite scene, the side boob. But she, people who don't know, she didn't really do a lot of act, acting. It was more she's become an Oscar-nominated and Oscar winner, I think, act, uh, producer. So partnered up with Tom Cruise for a long time, and she's really a top Hollywood player. Yeah, just in case our listeners out there aren't aware who Sherry Lansing is now. All right, let's talk about film locations. The beginning train scene was in uh, Morales, Mexico, and the rest of the film was in Tucson, Arizona. What did you think of the, the shooting locations, Patrick? I mean, once again, John Wayne ends up barricaded in that same jail, uh, very... <laughs> And that's something you haven't seen since, well, since 1967. So it, it's, it's once again, familiar <laughs> territory. It, it's definitely a different jail than used in Rio Bravo. I cannot say that it's a different jail used from um, El Dorado, but uh, you know, it's, it's, they're going very similar. They're, they're going near the, and because I've been the old Tucson area, they're going to, you know, that, that little river, fake river thing that runs through old Tucson you know, that's similar to where they shot the sequence in Rio Bravo. I mean, there's a lot of similarities in the film for the, the climactic sequence. And it's, you know, there, I won't even say someone jumps in the river in Rio Bravo as well, but maybe it's because I'm confusing the, the three films that use the same storyline. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, I, I like old Tucson. It's, it's very familiar to me, you know, to see the mountain landscape that I can see literally see outside my, my window is it's kind of nice and I, I find it very comforting to watch a film. And I think it's a good location for a lot of Westerns. I, I like the civil war aspect of the parts that was filmed in Mexico. I mean, I think it, I think it doubles pretty well um, for the, the woodsy area of that's uh, more aligned along the lines of the East coast. So I find it very, very believable. I think it works very effectively. Um, I, I do find it interesting that the old Tucson is supposed to double for Texas, um, it always I does. I know it always does, and I don't think I don't think of Texas as uh, barren as I think of Arizona. Sometimes, I mean, there's areas of it, but I I don't think that it all looks quite as barren as this. And I don't I don't think of Texas as quite as mountainous as uh, 
as the the mm-hmm. Tucson being surrounded by as many mountains as that there are you always mention old tucson i feel like i've been there myself i've seen it so many times which one was the fake river that you mentioned well the the, in this the climactic sequence there's the there's the they go across a bridge and jumps into that little maybe not a river but it's a stream um, I, it, there's, I don't believe they have a, a stream that runs through old Tucson. They, they may fill it up with water for filming, but uh, they have a similar sequence in Rio Bravo. And I want to say that there's a bridge and there's, uh, that stream is filled up and it's, uh, it may be going the other direction. Um, but they use the kind of the same, I, I want to say the exact same area of old Tucson. Granted, there was about 20 years or 15 years in between. So, uh, yeah. they altered it slightly, but. Well, even the dynamite scene, uh, it was basically in the same area as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was familiar. And the um, there's this, the scene at the start when they were at that river. That's why I was asking when he gets jumped and John Wayne falls into the water and they drag him out at the start. There was the green, like the grass at the edge, the water's edge looked so bright and lime green. It looked fake. So that's why I actually thought that's what you meant by the the fake river, fake stream. Um, I don't know if you noticed that, but it just you could tell that it was either just put there or the, the I don't know if it was fake grass or moss, but it didn't look real to me in that moment. I think location, that was Mexico but, still. That that doesn't yeah. look like uh, the southern Arizona that I know. The locations were good though. I I thought they were okay. I mean, I I don't get the Tucson doubling as Texas and that I uh, sort of don't notice it as much as you guys, but I do always re- recognize this town gets used in so many movies and television shows. All right, let's go around the table here. Final thoughts of the film and on a scale of one to five Rio Bravo remakes, how many do you give it? Shane, let's start with you. <laughs> Well, other than the acting in the dentist's chair, which was a little bit over the top, but I thought John Wayne was pretty good. And this is definitely the best one yet I have uh, reviewed on on our John Wayne Movie House Memories podcast. Uh, Sherry Lansing and Jennifer O'Neill, I liked also. I know Patrick is probably cringing, but the acting overall was all right. I got a bit annoyed by Jackie Lamb and, and a few other smaller characters, but on a whole, I really was surprised. I got into Rio Lobo and, and loved basically every minute of it, minute of it. And it gets a, what are we giving it out of five? Rio Bravo remakes. Four Rio Bravo remakes out of five. Patrick. No, it's going to be sad, Shane, if you watch Rio Bravo and actually give it less Rio Bravo remake. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that that one is the better film. I, you know, Shane is under the misconception that I hate this film. I don't hate this film. As I said, it's a very comfortable John Wayne film. It's, you know, I I grew up. One of the reasons we called Sunday Seconds with the Duke is uh, that's what I would do is watch uh, on Sunday mornings watching John Wayne films with my parents when I was a kid because they'd be on TBS. And this was one probably came on a few times. I, you know, it's very comfortable. I, you know, I don't like the performance of it, but that's more me becoming more critical of films as I've gotten older. Uh, You know, it's not a great film. Rio Bravo is a better film. El Dorado is a better film. Uh, But it's not an absolutely horrible film. We've we've seen some horrible films, uh, uh, much more worse films with John Wayne. So I, I'm going to give it two, but I don't completely dislike the film. There are some a lot of things I do like of it. There's other John Wayne films that I completely dislike, but that's not this one. I like it a little bit more than Patrick. I will admit that uh, as the as I get older and watch re- revisit this film, it doesn't hold up quite as well the the acting it gets to me now um jennifer o'neill was probably the most grating uh jorge rivero he you could just omit him i i think of the three remakes he his is the weakest of all the characters so not really big fan of it but i'm going to give this film two and a half rio bravo remakes like patrick said it's not the worst of the john wayne films and I get enough entertainment from Jack Elam 
uh, to still enjoy this film. I wish the bad guys were a little bit more bad guy ish to me, but you know, like I said, I'm kind of tainted by um, typecasting for some of the for some of the actors. So, yeah, that's true. The villains in it weren't bad enough to dislike. You know, so you're right there. They could have gone a bit stronger. Uh, the actor Victor French for Ketchum, he's he's yeah. a much better actor than this performance he he gave, and he really didn't do much in this film. He basically. John Wayne walked in, smacked him around, gave him a black eye, set his legs on fire. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was under his control for the rest of the film. He did not put up any fight for the rest of the film. He was the human shield. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and Whitey comes in at the very beginning of the film and he's the only villain or, you know, traitor that is identified by the other characters prior to that. And he gets killed within about 30 seconds. And of course, how can you kill Exodor from Mork and Mindy that quickly in any, any kind of film and not expect some a- audience backlash? Mm-hmm. Is that who he is? I, I don't remember much about Mork and Mindy, but I, yeah. I recognized his face, so I've probably seen him in another film or films. And there was only one scene where really John Wayne was getting drunk. It's quite often in his movies he's drunk a lot more, but there was that one scene and then he wakes up next to... He thanks these lucky stars. He woke up next to Jennifer O'Neill. Well, yeah, he seemed upset about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, yeah, he was not like there's Where's other those two guys from the shower in the bar. I want exactly. to. There's some films where he's kind of anti women, but this one, he wasn't even anti women. He was just kind of um, asexual, I guess you could say, in this film. Just, you know, he was enjoying his life for him. And, um, mm. And, and romance just he could care less about. Yeah. He was comfortable. Well, of, of comfortable. That was yellow. his word, comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. comfortable. Of course, he had the yellow uh, scarf on when he was in uniform during the war moments of the film. But then the first time he's seen without the yellow scarf, he's got a pink scarf on. <laughs> Maybe that says something too. Mm-hmm. All right, it's time to mosey off into the sunset. So please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If there's a John Wayne film you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, your pick, and location. And finally, if you are of the social media persuasion, you can look the MHM Podcast Network up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you do, please give us a follow when you find us. On behalf of the whole gang here at Sunday Seconds with the Duke, we'd like to thank you for listening and remember, there's more to being a cowboy than just wearing the boots. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Sunday Seconds with the Duke, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. The theme song for Sunday Seconds with the Duke, Guts and Bourbon, is brought to you by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license.